to lead us into the presence of God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, if you're excited to be in God's house just one more time, you don't have to be in a church to praise God. We just want to praise him this morning. So as you enter this place, the song says he is worthy to be praised because we come to praise the Lord. Come on, Lord, praise him.
Hallelujah. It's a simple song that talks about how awesome God is. And we just want to sing about that. Come on, let's praise him this morning. Awesome God, it is worthy to be praised. Amen. And we're just going to sing a little slow song to talk about how we worship our God. The song says, Oh Lord, we worship and adore 
your name. Come, let's sing that all together. Oh Lord.
believe it. All right, we're just gonna keep praising our God this morning as our guests enter this building. Jesus be exalted. This is a little Jesus. Amen. Anybody know there's no other name above the name of our God? The simple song says, Jesus, be exalted. Come on, let's all sing that together.
All right, we just gonna keep, they just say, keep singing. All right, we just gonna keep singing. All right. Hallelujah.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Congressman Cedric L. Richmond, Chair of the Board of Directors for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Chairman Richmond represents the second congressional district of Louisiana, stretching from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. He serves on the House Committee on Homeland Security, the House Committee on the Judiciary, is a member of the New Democratic Coalition and Democratic Assistant to the Majority Whip. Congressman Richmond tirelessly advocates for American jobs, our national safety, and criminal justice reform. Congressman Cedric L. Richmond. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Please, please join me in thanking the Alpha Street Baptist Church Choir of Alexandria, Virginia. That was an amazingly spiritually uplifting music ministry at a time when our spirits most need to be lifted up. Music has long been used by movements seeking social change. From singing songs of freedom during slavery to helping to build bridges, today music still plays an essential role in bolstering courage, inspiring participation, and fostering a sense of community. Let us also give a great shout out of praise for their dynamic senior pastor and leader, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. On behalf of our outstanding CBCF Board of Directors, I am honored to welcome you to the CBCF Annual Legislative Conference Prayer Breakfast. Our world-class Board of Directors' full investment in advancing the CBCF's work is critically important to fulfilling our mission of equipping tomorrow's leaders for the challenges that lie ahead. With the CBCF board members, please stand so we can properly thank you for your year-round commitment to advancing the global black community. Board members, please stand. Our annual legislative conference theme, 400 years, our legacy, our possibilities, reflects our long and difficult journey through brutal American enslavement to our rich legacy of resiliency, resistance, rebuilding, and our present task of establishing unlimited new possibilities for black Americans. Our struggle for justice, equity, and equality continues, but we serve a mighty God who promises to equip us for victory in every battle. Prepare your hearts now for the spirit-moving sounds of gospel music legend, Miss Yolanda Adams, and the prophetic preaching of one of the nation's most incredible new generation preachers, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Before I take my seat, let me thank our fantastic Annual Legislative Conference co-chairs, Congressman G.K. Butterfield and Congresswoman Frederica Wilson for their strong leadership together with that of our Congressional Black Caucus Chair, Congresswoman Karen Bass, for making this year's ALC an overwhelming success. My thanks as well to the dedicated CBCF staff and the many committed volunteers who are contributing enormously to advancing the mission of the CBCF through the ALC. We at the CBCF pray that you will each leave here spiritually fired up, ready to vote in the 2020 election, and ready to be fully counted in the 2020 census. Our 400-year investment in making America great means that we have a huge stake in a complete census count and in voting like we have never voted before for leaders who will invest in the highest possibilities for our communities. Please enjoy the prayer breakfast. It is now my pleasure to introduce the new president and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Mr. David Henson. Mr. Henson has, thank you. Give him a round of applause. Mr. Henson has long championed diversity and inclusion for minorities internationally. He recently served as an executive at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, developing their Institute for Diversity and Emerging Businesses. 
With that, bring up our new president and CEO, Mr. David Henson. Thank you, Congressman Richmond, for that warm interjection. The Bible says, where there are two or more gathered in my name, there I shall be also. So I greet you this morning by saying thank you so much for coming, and it feels good to be in the house of the Lord. I thank God for your support of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation over the years and for the support to come. You may notice that we do not have printed programs at your seats. In our effort to be sensitive to God's earth, we are providing programs digitally. So please go to www.cbcfinc.org forward slash ALC to obtain today's program. I am grateful for the opportunity to join an outstanding group of legislators led by Congressman Richmond, who are advancing our mission of training the next generation of black leaders, informing policy, and educating the public. Every year, the annual legislative conference offers us an excellent opportunity to bring America's greatest minds together around the pressing issues of our time. We foster debate, we promote innovative ideas, and we forge consensus on pathways to improve our community. As Representative Richmond indicated, our theme this year is 400 years, our legacy, our possibilities. When I think about this theme, I am reminded that while America has been a nation for 243 years, we have been in this land for 400 years. In fact, we came before Columbus. Through the power of our unbreakable spirit, we can restore true civility in our nation and build a future that is fair, equitable, and without fear. This is what we do at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I hope you will share a similar belief and commitment to participate. The CBCF is grateful to all of our corporate partners and donors for their support that sustains our work. We are also indebted to the many African-American focused run businesses that provide support to our organization. An example is the Word Network, the largest African-American focused religious network in the world. I am honored this morning to introduce Prayer Breakfast co-founder and president of the Skinner Leadership Institute, my friend, Reverend Dr. Barbara William Skinner. She is the author of the book, I Prayed, Now What? and companion discussion guide now available for sale in Hall E and benefiting the CBCF Leadership Institute. Following the call to worship and prayer for the nation, we are honored to have Iman Talib Sharif present our invocation and prayer for the meal. Iman uh, Sharif is president and resident imam of Majid Mohammed, the nation's mosque. Please join William, uh, Dr. William Skinner as she presents our call to worship and prayer for the nation followed by Imam Talib Sharif giving the invocation and prayer for the meal. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, our rock, our rescue, our redeemer, and our restorer, we bow this morning in a spirit of worship with hearts, minds, and our souls fully surrendered to the only one who has all power. Your word beckons us to bring our burdens, our afflictions, and our loads of care. We are for a God for whom nothing is impossible. So we lift up before you our many hu humanly impossible burdens this morning, Lord. Our burden for the destruction and near devastation of the Bahamas and our prayer for speedy restoration, renewal, and rebuilding so desperately needed 
in this very hour. Our burden for the 400 year debt now owed to those whose ancestors were kidnapped, enslaved, and systematically dehumanized even while building a nation they loved that never loved them back. Our burden for the caging of brown babies, for an American prison re-enslavement system, for doors of freedom slammed shut on desperate asylum seekers, for those making a mockery of democracy and suppressing the precious right to vote for those, oh God, who would ban Muslims from our shores and now for the burden of the escalating evil acts in high places now threatening our very democracy. But oh, how profoundly grateful we are this morning, dear God, that the 13 founding members of the Congressional Black Caucus, now 55 strong, answered your question to the prophet Isaiah, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And with their collective and decisive, here we are, God, send us, send all 55 of us. So for every burden we have borne, that they have borne, and are now bearing on our behalf, God. May you forever sustain, empower, and invigorate our courageous legislative warriors to keep on standing in the gap for all of us and for vulnerable Americans of every race. We pray this prayer in the matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name of Jesus, our Restorer, and our Redeemer, let the people say amen. Good morning, and God's peace be upon us all. Let us continue in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, the merciful, the wise, the most high possessor of greatness, we thank you for blessing us with our precious life, and we humbly beseech your divine providence on the CBCF, its staff, its members, the distinguished sponsors, leaders, and all gathered here at this annual prayer breakfast. We thank you for bringing together leaders from around the nation who have an interest in contributing fully to empowering, advancing, and bettering the critical circumstances of the African American community and the American public at large. As one of our giants, the CBCF has helped lift up our people. And any time you have lift up your people to the point where they discover themselves, their potential, and their own worth as a human being, and respect themselves, then as we are seeing, then those people become not only a healthy, powerful resource to themselves, but also to the nation where they claim citizenship. Almighty God, who created us all, and cares about us all equally. Bless us to be reflective of e pluribus unum, out of many, one. One nation, one humanity, one common origin dating back to Adam, who when you created, didn't have a racial identity, nor ethnic, nor national identity, etc., but rather the most important identity, which was human. And in and from that identity came the many beautiful, wonderful, diverse expressions of human life, all that have contributed to the beauty and strength of America. A country blessed to establish itself upon the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all, regardless of race, national origin, sex, etc., are created equal, recognizing sameness for all people, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here, we see that the Constitution of these United States does not base itself upon the identity or classification of a race or nationality. It bases itself upon the life needs and aspirations of every human soul, the universal person or type that is in each and every one of us. And we thank you, Almighty God, 
for blessing this idea to be the core of what makes America the beautiful. As this marks the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans to arrive in 1619, a people who were denied life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we are here today to praise and thank you for blessing us to have survived those 400 years of terror, 250 of which, the worst form of enslavement in human history, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of state-sanctioned redefining, redlining, constant racism, oppression, and injustice. But as you, Almighty God, Allah, where upon your will we weathered the storms, and like the sun we still rise, kept walking and sacrificing in the struggle to see our humanity free, staying the course, having been knocked down with getting up, never gave up and kept our faith up and moved up and didn't let the inhumane treatment kill our hope nor the champion that you have deposited inside of us, and that is the dynamic human soul of an oppressed people. And lastly, Almighty God, we thank you for and ask that you bless the food we're about to receive and those who are preparing it. And we ask that you continue to bless us with sustained progress, good leadership, and a table spread on the basis of unity, the united, and as for united we stand, and divided we are falling every day. In and with your name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage the amazing voices of the Alfred Street Baptist Church Choir.
Jesus. All the time, everybody say it. Our CBCF ALC Honorary Co-Chairs, Congresswoman Frederica S. Wilson and Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Congresswoman Frederica S. Wilson proudly represents Florida's 24th Congressional District and was elected to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives in 2010. As a former educator, school board member, state legislator, and the founder of the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence Project, Congresswoman Wilson has earned a reputation as a voice for the voiceless. The Florida lawmaker chairs the Education and Labor Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions, and serves on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Congressman G.K. Butterfield represents the first district of North Carolina in the U.S. House of Representatives in an area from Durham to Wilson, serving on the Influential Committee on Energy and Commerce and the House Administration Committee, Congressman Butterfield champions affordable health care, education, rural communities, veterans, renewable energies, and support low-income and middle-class Americans. In the Democratic leadership, he is Chief Deputy Whip and past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Frederica S. Wilson and Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My ancestral home, Abaco, Bahamas, was devastated by Hurricane Dorian two weeks ago. And as I speak, the island, the same exact islands are in the path of another hurricane. The emotional and mental effect is traumatizing. They are still counting the dead. Please pray for the Bahamas. Please pray for my people. Please pray for me. This morning, as you entered, you were greeted by young boys 
from the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence program passing out red roses. They are from Miami, Jacksonville, and Broward County, Florida. It is an in-school dropout prevention program that I founded 27 years ago. Our goal is to interrupt the school-to-prison pipeline. So pray for them, too. It is such a pleasure to join my friend and colleague, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, as an honorary co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Legislative Conference. This year's theme, 400 Years, Our Legacy, Our Possibilities, is a reminder of how far African Americans have come and how far we have yet to go. This summer, I had the privilege of traveling with Speaker Nancy Pelosi and a group of CBC members to Ghana, where we laid wreaths in remembrance of millions of Africans who lost their lives and freedom in the transatlantic slave trade. And we actually went through the door of no return. It was an extremely humbling experience that I will never, ever forget. Like many people, I've read the history books and watched the films detailing the abominations of our African brothers and sisters who were forced to endure but entering those dungeons transports you back in time, and their pain becomes unbearable. I'm still haunted by the experience. Shh. We are here this morning to bear witness that God who promises never to leave or forsake us is here with us today, and despite systemic injustices, racism, domestic terrorism, gun violence, mass incarceration, and a myriad of other evils, he will see us through. He got us from the slave house to the White House, and he will guide our way to new opportunities and triumphs. As we commemorate 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived here, let us remember that America's greatness would not exist without the extraordinary contributions that black people have made and continue to make in every aspect of American life. We fought the nation's wars built its cities and towns, and contributed immeasurably to its culture, arts and literature, music, science, education, politics, and more. We did not come here willingly 400 years ago, but we too sing America. ALC is the leading policy conference on issues impacting African Americans and the global black community. This year, in addition to honoring those who suffered at the hands of brutal slave masters, we also raised awareness and explored issues related to economic development, civil and social justice, health and education, science and technology, political engagement from a black perspective, and more. This is how we build upon our truly amazing legacy. And by the power of God, we will continue to make great strides for our communities and our nation. I don't know about you, 
but I'm very hopeful about our future as a people. That is why I am so delighted to introduce one of our CBCF Leadership Institute Energy Fellows, Ms. Camille Moore, with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. In her role with OSCE, Ms. Moore covers economics, environmental issues related to the Baltic states. Her development as a policy advocate has made possible by your support, your support of the CBCF Leadership Institute. Please join me in welcoming Miss Camille Moore. Camille. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Wilson. I came to Washington, D.C. with the dream of influencing policy. And the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has helped shape and support that dream. Coming from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and graduating from Oakwood University, the CBCF allowed me to create policies that I am truly passionate about. I had the pleasure of serving in the office of Congressman Anthony Brown, a true legislator. In his office, I was able to draft, develop, and help pass through the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, the Homecoming Act, which is now law. This is a bill that will strengthen the relationship between historically black colleges and the Department of Defense, providing new opportunities both for our students and for our communities. Today, I am serving on the U.S. Helsinki Commission under the leadership of Chairman Alcee Hastings and exploring topics of economics and environment. Your contributions make it possible and have made it possible for me to explore policies both in Asia and across Europe. Thank you for ensuring that young professionals like myself are equipped to explore our dreams. Thank you for creating, investing, and building the future, our future. Thank you so much. Good morning to those of you who are talking and to those of you who are not. Good morning. Good morning. They asked me if I would find a polite way to say that, and that's the best I can do it. Thank you, Congresswoman Wilson. It has been a pleasure working and serving as honorary co-chair with you in this year's annual legislative conference. Like you, I have been inspired by the ALC, where thought leaders and legislators and concerned citizens engage on economic development, civil and social justice, public health, and education issues. The ALC theme, the ALC theme, 400 years, our legacy, our possibilities, has a very special meaning. You should know that 246 of those years were involved in chattel slavery. At your leisure, please take a deep dive into this history, all 400 years of this history. It is a riveting story of triumph. We cannot legitimately discuss American history without discussing the history of slavery. From 1619, to the ratification of the 13th Amendment on December 6, 1865. I am proud to be as co-sponsor, along with Congressman Bobby Scott of Virginia, of H.R. 1242, which became law 
establishing the 400 years of the African American History Commission. The commission marked August of 2019 to begin commemorating or recognizing or observing 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived at Fort Comfort, Virginia, by shaping programs throughout America that recognize 400 years of African American contributions and their legacy of achievements. It also, it also encourages us and our allies to build upon the very best of our legacy by developing impactful ways to build a new social infrastructure, addressing climate change, decaying physical infrastructure, rapidly disappearing jobs, and voter suppression, underperforming schools, uneven access to health care, and lack of affordable housing. You know what I'm talking about. Remember our history while tackling our possibilities means attacking voter suppression so that in 2020, our power to vote is not hacked, it is not purged, it is not discounted or suppressed in any way. It means, my friends, that we must register and vote because our lives depend on it. It means to be counted. We must be heard, preparing now for the 2020 elections and being counted in the 2020 census. The census is critical, ladies and gentlemen, because it will determine how $800 billion will be spent on education, on health care, on public safety, and other areas, including the number of state and congressional representatives we have. Most of all, tackling our possibilities means using our power. The 55 of us, along with our allies across the nation, using our power and influence to house the homeless, produce criminal justice reform, educate children in all zip codes, promote wealth equality, promote sensible gun control, reform an immigration system that cages small children like animals, strengthening the voting rights laws and providing affordable health care. Speaking of tackling possibilities in social and economic justice, we in the CBC, under the leadership of Congresswoman Karen Bass, truly respect and love our dynamic chair. Like many here, Karen is a staunch advocate for reform both through the law and through grassroots activism. Here to properly introduce our leader is one of our stellar CBCF Leadership Institute Diversity and Technology Fellows, Mr. Christopher Ross Cox. Mr. Cox is a graduate, Mr. Benny Thompson, of Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi and served as a Leadership Institute Fellow in the office of Congresswoman Yvette Clark of New York. Currently, he is the Senior Legislative Assistant for Congresswoman Clark when he oversees the energy and commerce portfolio that includes technology, telecommunications, and health. Please welcome him at this time. Thank you, Congressman Butterfield. I really appreciate that. Um, good morning. Good morning. I'm honored to stand before you today as a recent alumnus of the Congressional Black Caucus Fellowship Program. Galatians 5th chapter and 13th verse says that you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but not, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Each of your acts of service to the Leadership Institute has and will continue to progress the mission of the CBC as your work and dedication energizes young politicos like me, who humbly and reverently stand on your shoulders. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce a wonderful example of what we aspire to be. 
Congresswoman Karen Bass, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congresswoman Bass proudly represents the residents of the 37th Congressional District of California. She has devoted her life and career to serving others. An active voice for criminal justice reform, fighting for America's foster care system, and strengthening the U.S.'s ties with Africa, she works tirelessly to ensure equality and justice for all. So please stand and join with me in welcoming to the podium Congresswoman Karen Bass, CBC Chairwoman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am so happy and proud to be here with you this morning. And why don't we give our CBCF Leadership Fellows another round of applause. I will tell you that I'm honored to be sitting next to one of the alumni from the Leadership Institute, who I can now call my colleague, and I know you'll be hearing from her shortly, Lauren Underwood. But um, I would like to add my thanks to our two hardworking honorary co-chairs, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson and Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Please put your hands together and help me thank them for their leadership. Being chair of the 55-member Congressional Black Caucus, with five members serving as full committee chairs, three members in the top leadership of Congress, and 28 members chairing critical subcommittees in a Congress that has 101 new members is a tremendous honor. Since 1971, members of the CBC have been the conscience of the Congress, uplifting the voices of the voiceless for the most vulnerable among us. The CBC collectively represents 82 million Americans, including 17, Af 17 million African Americans. Let me tell you that all over this country every day, the CBC is making extraordinary efforts to improve the lives of all of us by fighting to close the wealth gap, expand voting rights, fund our historically black colleges, protect our environment, and preserve and expand the Affordable Care Act. I want to express my gratitude for all the members of the CBC for your leadership on Capitol Hill and across communities nationwide. So now I'd like to ask the distinguished members of the Congressional Black Caucus, please stand and remain standing as we thank you for your amazing legislative work at an extremely challenging time in our nation. Please stand, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. We are also profoundly grateful for the CBC spouses and their extraordinary efforts on behalf of the CBC Foundation throughout the year to support and equip young leaders. Will the CBC spouses please stand so we can express our gratitude to you. And what could we possibly do in challenging times like these without the spiritual giants as the divinely guided wind beneath our wings all year long? Our faith leaders. Will the faith leaders who are here today please stand? We have come this far by deeply rooted faith and much hard work. The faith that allowed our foreparents to courageously overcome unimaginable hardships and survive is the same faith that teaches us that those who have oppressed us will be called to account for their actions. Let us push right on past the mean-spirited efforts to turn back the clock on decades of civil and human rights progress by our strong voter turnout in 2020. In spite of all that we have been through in the past and in the present, 
We do know what to do in 2020, am I right? We know what we need to do in 2020. We know what our nation needs in order for all of us to continue moving forward in 2020. While we are taking care of business in 2020 by voting, we have proven that even in spite of voter suppression, we are able to survive and we are able to win because we know how to organize, we know how to turn out, and we know how to vote. Now at the same time as we're taking care of that business next year, we have the census that is going to be taking place at the same time. We will not allow anyone to hold us back because the CBC looks forward to working with all of you to commemorate our ancestors 400 years, our legacy, our possibilities. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a celebrated gospel music legend and five-time Grammy Award-winning artist whose anointed music heals, encourages, and inspires audiences worldwide while transforming the musical landscape. Since her 1988 debut with the acclaimed and uplifting song, Just As I Am, Yolanda has been wowing gospel audiences around the globe. And now, the incomparable Yolanda Adams. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. God bless you. It is a pleasure to be here with you once again. I love to come and just celebrate with you, especially at the prayer breakfast. We know what it's all about. And this song here epitomizes what we've been speaking about all morning long. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman.
bless you. We're taught as children that we have an open connection with God and all we have to do is come to him and pray. That's what I love about the prayer breakfast. Thank you again to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the invitation. We love you all so much. Be blessed.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Lori George Billingsley, Global Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Coca-Cola and Vice Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board of Directors. Mrs. Billingsley proudly leads the company's Global Diversity and Inclusion Center of Excellence, including the diversity, inclusion, and workplace fairness teams for North America. Since its inception in 1981, this prayer breakfast has been made possible through the generous sponsorship of the Coca-Cola companies, together with your faithful support. Good morning. It brings me great joy to be here with you at the 2019 Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Prayer Breakfast. To my fellow Howard University alum, Mr. David Henson, President and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, the Honorable Karen Bass, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Honorable Cedric Richmond, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board of Directors, and this year's conference co-chairs, the Honorable G.K. Butterfield and the Honorable Frederica Wilson. On behalf of our chairman and CEO, James Quincy, who is here with us this morning, and the entire Coca-Cola system, we want to congratulate you on your 49th annual legislative conference. Since Coca-Cola's inception in 1886, the world has changed. People today want new and different things, not just from us, but from all companies. And while we've always been the Coca-Cola company, we are more than just Coca-Cola. We are a total beverage company. We have sports drinks, cold pressed juices, teas, coffees, coconut waters, and more. An array of refreshing beverages for people everywhere, including those on your table this morning. One thing that hasn't changed are our values. We proudly stand for the values of inclusion and integrity, for inspiring moments of optimism, and for bringing all people of diverse backgrounds together. We strive to do the right thing for people and the planet. We aim to help create shared opportunity in every community we serve. Your tireless work on Capitol Hill and in the hills and valleys of every community does the same and we thank you. This morning I am charged with bringing our occasion and helping us to reflect upon the conference theme. 1619, that is the year that the first Africans were stolen from the arms of their family and the only land they knew to be dehumanized into slavery on the shores of the colonial skeleton of this not yet fully formed country. While those 20 enslaved Africans were considered dead by their family, they gave birth through tear-stained trauma and emotion to who and where we are today, our legacy. In spite of the brutalities of slavery, our ancestors demonstrated a resilience unheard of, risking life and stealing away in the dark of night in an attempt to breathe the fresh air of freedom our legacy. Long walks home in the heat of the summer and cold of the winter in Montgomery, Alabama. Sit-ins at the counter without service. Freedom rides. Bloody marches across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with icons like Georgia's Congressman John Lewis. Our legacy is one of courage, of tenacity, resilience, and strength. We kept hope alive when there was no reason to hope. Our legacy is also one of brilliance, wisdom, and genius. Mathematicians whose calculations could lead you out of this universe, from Brown versus Board of Education to the chambers of the Supreme Court, from manual labor and secretaries to the U.S. Secretary of Labor. With a baseline of rhythm and traces of blues, our resounding legacy 
reverberates from the steps of Constitution Hall to the inauguration ball of our country's first black president. It is the richness of our experience and our legacy that makes me all the more confident in the future of our possibilities. The Congressional Black Caucus's Foundation's mission and purpose focuses on shaping the leaders of tomorrow. Through scholarship, internship, and leadership programs, CBCF works to eliminate societal barriers and give young leaders access to rooms, offices, and worlds that otherwise would be inaccessible. We stand in support of these young people, including and especially the table of fellows here with us this morning. CBCF builds upon century-old legacy and creates a world of endless possibilities, possibilities that could never have been fathomed by the 20 or so Africans that came to the now Virginia shore 400 years ago. The possibility that young students, whether from single parent households or raised by other family, from across the country, across the diaspora, or born right here in Washington, D.C., the possibility that these students could go on to excel at educational institutions like Columbia University or my alma mater, Howard University, and through CBCF serve as fellows researching and crafting policy in some of the highest offices in the land. The possibility that a mother could be so passionately moved after the loss of her son that it fuels her campaign to not only just make her world better, but our world better through the hallowed halls of the United States of Congress. I'm reminded of the scripture in Matthew 19, 26. With people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. As we move into a new realm of possibilities, know that the Coca-Cola Company will be with you in partnership every step of the day. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage CBCF alum, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Congresswoman Underwood serves Illinois' 14th Congressional District and was sworn into the 116th U.S. Congress. The first woman, the first person of color, the first millennial representing her community in Congress, and the youngest African-American woman to serve in the United States House of Representatives. Congresswoman Underwood serves on the House Committee on Education and Labor, the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, the House Committee on Homeland Security, and the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. It is my honor to come before you as a member of Congress who benefited personally and directly from the good work of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and especially the Leadership Institute. You see, I was a 2006 intern with the Institute, and many of the leadership lessons I have applied in my role as a member of Congress, like valuing the lives of all people, lifting up those at the bottom, modeling excellence, in all that I do, and building bridges with people of all backgrounds were sharpened during my incredible experience as a CBCF leadership intern. That's why your support of the CBCF today is so absolutely vital. Undergirded by your prayers and financial support, the work of CBCF has been nothing less than amazing. Approximately 3,000 interns have graduated from the CBCF program. Approximately 250 fellows have graduated from the CBCF program. Approximately 30% of all CBCF Leadership Institute alumni have worked on Capitol Hill. Approximately 6,500 students have received scholarships from the foundation. We are also excited to report a number of additional leadership advancement programs that equip and nurture a new generation of young leaders. In calendar year 2018, 
there are an amazing 3.6 million visitors to the CVCF website at www.cvcfinc.org and across social networks and media impression. 400 scholarships were also awarded, totaling nearly $600,000. CBCF also awarded 50 congressional internships, 24 State Farm-sponsored communication internships, 23 Walmart-sponsored Emerging Leaders internships, and three Pathways to the C-Suite internships. Beyond all of these amazing CBCF accomplishments, there were 18 Japan Study Abroad Emerging Leaders supported through a multi-year, which is a four-year community grant from the United Health Foundation to help build healthier communities by increasing the number of African-American students entering into the health field. So as you can see, your support for CBCF directly undergirds programs that equip a new generation of dynamic young leaders to sit at decision-making tables in public and private sectors to address challenges in our communities. So let me now draw your attention to the big screen so you can see for yourselves how we are preparing a new cadre of public policy advocates and experts. I want you to just think about who you want to be. Each and every one of you will decide the direction of this nation. And I really do hope that you decide well. The CBCF program ensures that people who look like me and you have a voice on Capitol Hill and that when those decisions are being made, that we can be that voice for those communities who are so often left behind. Listen up. When I'm dancing with the angels, I am depending on you to go out there and make a difference. I'm, de I'm depending on you to save this democracy. I don't care who's in the White House. We are preparing you for a mission. You have been chosen. And understand that you have been chosen for greatness. One of the crucial elements of the CBCF program is that it provides housing and a stipend to those who are accepted. So this stipend basically allowed me to live in D.C. It allowed me to commute to work. It allowed me to eat every day. To offer money and to an assistance so that we can go beyond our wildest dreams is so empowering and it's so impactful. Just giving this young African-American male a dream and hope that he can accomplish that. Some people are telling us to go back. We're not going back. <laughs> well, not going back. When people tried to register to vote, they told us to go back on the march from Selma to Montgomery. We didn't go back. We kept moving. And as young people, you must keep moving. And to be redeemed the soul of America and create the beloved community. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you and said to you, you must never, ever give up. And so I got on the Hill and I started as a staff assistant, then I became a special assistant, and now I'm a legislative aide, and I'm having the opportunity to put my hands on policy. And this year I was accepted to Harvard Law School, so I feel like this whole experience that I've been able to get is going to greatly impact my time in law school and also the work that I do after law school. Even today, when I walk into a room, I carry the confidence with me of knowing that I'm prepared to take on whatever the next big task is. CBCF gave me that confidence, and now because of them, I dream bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at the next civic and servant leaders of our generation. I don't know about you, but we might get their autographs now because each and every one of them are off to do extraordinary things. I cannot wait to see what is in store for you after you use our time on Capitol Hill to build your professional networks and open doors towards your future. I am confident that one day we will run this country. Together, we can continue to increase diversity on Capitol Hill and equip future leaders in public service in our nation and around the world. Your support has placed more than 150 congressional fellows since 1976 and produced more than 1,500 alumni in our Leadership Institute for Public Service since 2000. Create opportunities. Give today at cbcfinc.org forward slash invest. Amazing 
testimonies show the incredible power of the CBCF Leadership Institute to open so many important doors, not only for those now in the program, but for all of us who have experienced the blessing of one-of-a-kind leadership equipping program. In the face of incredible challenges facing our nation, I appeal to each of you to support the CBCF Leadership Institute for Public Service and ask you right now to take out your device and text CBCF to 56512. Again, CBCF to 56512 to make a donation of any size. Your contribution will ensure that this amazing program continues strong and keeps on equipping young leaders like me to walk through the doors of power and responsibility that we have been blessed to walk through and become difference makers for our generation. If you're writing a check, we will definitely give you a minute. <laughs> Make your check out to CBCF and include Leadership Institute in the memo. Every single contribution means another internship, scholarship, or fellowship can be given to other promising leaders just like us. Please place your check in the envelope on your table and drop it in the basket next to the exit door and a designated member of the CBCF staff team will pick them up and secure them. We are also blessed this morning to announce the good news that Uber is supporting the annual legislative conference by offering a 10% discount to riders who use the CBCF ALC19 discount code for current Uber users through the menu payment and ad promotions features. Now, new Uber riders should key in CBCF ALC new 19, then click apply to receive your discounted ride and support CBCF in the process. Now, the really great news is that each time you take an Uber during ALC using the discount code, Uber will make a $5 donation to the CBCF. Won't he do it? Thank you again for your faithful support of CBCF and especially the Leadership Institute. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Johanna Hayes and Congressman Stephen Horsford for the Old Testament and New Testament scripture reading. Congresswoman Johanna Hayes was elected to the United States House of Representatives in November 2018, the first African-American woman and the first African-American Democrat to ever represent the state of Connecticut in Congress. Hayes, a former high school teacher and Connecticut Teacher of the Year, serves on the House Committee on Education and Labor. She champions equitable access to quality education, affordable health care for everyone, labor, agriculture, and the environment. Congressman Stephen Horsford represents the 4th District of Nevada, centered in Las Vegas. He is a member of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee, the House Budget Committee, and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He is a proven champion of Nevada's working families and a tireless fighter for affordable health care and gun control. Congressman Horsford also chairs the Congressional Black Caucus Task Force on the 2020 Census. Congresswoman Johanna Hayes and Congressman Stephen Horsford. Good morning, everyone. I also like to give an especially warm welcome to my church family, the delegation from the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and the bishops that are here this morning. I bring to you from the Old Testament my husband's favorite scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all, of our, in all of thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So basically, 
no matter what is happening. Thank God anyway. Good morning. Reading from Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. Please join me in welcoming back to the stage ALC co-chair, Congressman G.K. Butterfield. As they say at my church, it's preaching time. What'd you say, Reverend Jackson? It is my honor my high honor to introduce a young man, well known locally and all across the nation for his cutting edge, inspiring preaching, leading one of the fastest growing churches in the nation, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. A magna cum laude graduate of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, in my congressional district. Reverend Dr. Wesley is a fifth generation Baptist preacher, prophetic messenger, and senior pastor of one of the oldest and most prominent African American congregations, the Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Founded in 1803, they proudly have 8,000 members in the church, and it is growing. Services on Saturday night at 6 p.m., Sunday morning, 7.30, 9.30, and 11.30 a.m. I have been there many times. If you go, you will never forget that experience, a powerful church. Alfred Street is a leader among churches in the spiritual, economic, educational, cultural, and social advancement of African Americans. The church has distinguished itself by generously donating $1 million to the establishment of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. After a month-long fast last year, the church also paid off $100,000 of debt, not for the church, but for 34 Howard University graduates. <laughs> Founded in 1803, over 60% of the Alfred Street congregation graduated from HBCUs. What a man, what a ministry. After ministry in music by the dynamic Yolanda Adams, the next voice you will hear will be that of the messenger for the morning, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley.
Grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as father and mother and Jesus Christ my resurrected my risen my reigning and my returning Redeemer let me hasten and hustle to thank God for the hands and hearts God used to provide me this awesome privilege and humbling honor to stand before you 
for just a few brief moments to share my conviction about God's grace and God's mercy. To our CBCF president, and CEO, Brother David Henson, to the chair of the board, the Honorable Cedric Richmond, to our CBC chairwoman, Congresswoman Karen Bass, to our co-chairs, the Honorable Frederica Wilson and G.K. Butterfield, when Congressman Butterfield called me to invite me to stand in this moment, I thought it was a cruel joke, and I'm thankful to God that he was not playing. Uh, to the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, in whom we put our trust and our faith to lead and to guide us in this land, to the invariable Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner, the visionary and founder of our prayer breakfast. <laughs> to those sisters and brothers in this place who share the burden and the blessing of preaching and teaching God's holy word, I am grateful to God for the encouragement of so many friends and colleagues in ministry who have sent words of encouragement and prayer prior to this moment. I need to say this so that the record is clear that I am a proud life pen wearing member greatest fraternal organization God has ever created in the history of fraternities, and that would be Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. And, and, amen. Y'all gonna make me say it. I, I, my congregation knows at Duke University, I actually went to an Omega Sci Fi interest meeting um, and they told me I couldn't join because my GPA was too high. Um, <laughs> hey man, I, I say that I want to honor the 34th Grand Pole Mark of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, Brother Reuben Shelton, who's here with us today. Brother Grand Pole Mark, it is good to be in your presence. Thank you and welcome. And to all the family and friends of faith that are gathered in this place today, allow me to plagiarize the words of the psalmist who said in Psalm 118 that this is the day the Lord has made. And we gather to rejoice and to be glad in it. And we rejoice on any day that God has given us because at your table, is living, breathing proof that mercy still works, that grace is undefeated, and that the sovereignty of God may be challenged but can never be conquered. If you know that you are alive today because God is good and has been better to you than you could ever deserve, would you just help me set the atmosphere for worship and somebody give thanks to God for another day that the Lord has made. I am, I'm under no misconception or misillusion. I know that I only stand before you this morning because there are four words that are attached to my name somehow. Alfred Street Baptist Church. And I, for 11 years, have had the joy of worshiping with some of the greatest saints of God that the Lord has ever put in my presence. And that was one of our choirs that blessed you earlier, our Royal Priesthood Choir. And there are members of the Alpha Street Baptist Church all around. If give me, let me just be a pastor for a moment. I'm gonna ask all my family of faith to stand. I am blessed of the Lord for all these brothers and sisters. Amen. They may be proud of me, but I am more proud of them. Uh, what an honor it is to be part of that family of faith. Lord, guide my mind and my mouth, my head and my heart. Allow there to be no gap between your will and my words. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Let the church say amen. We got up early this morning, 
some of us a little bit earlier than usual or that we would like on a Saturday morning. We put on the clothes we had laid out last night, took a little extra time to fix our faces, tighten our weaves, shine our shoes, <laughs> Listerine our breath, shake off the remnant of whatever your Friday night was and should not have been. that we might gather in this space today and transform it into a sacred sanctuary where we gather and worship in the presence of God. And I hope that you didn't come today for the wrong reason. That we didn't gather in this place at 7 a.m. in the morning because the convention center has the best cold eggs and undercooked sausage <laughs> that you've ever had. We didn't gather simply to rub elbows at the table and pass out business cards looking to make the next open door in our lives. We didn't gather in this space because at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, we didn't have anything else to do. It was not the breakfast that drove us here. What pushed and pressed me and prayerfully you into this place was the adjective that preceded breakfast. That one word, prayer. That we've gathered in this place because as our ancestors used to say, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. We've gathered in this place to pray because we face some dark and dire times in our land. We come to pray because there is an evil that we thought was in remission, but is now painfully resurgent. We come to pray because violence and vulgarity has become too commonplace in our daily experience. And rather than America being beautiful or great again, we have become something that is detestable in the eyes of our God. We come to pray because we now have the first Russian elected president of the United States of America who has no problem incarcerating immigrant children while he acts like a child and uses crayons to color on maps to double down on lies that he's once told. We gather to pray because victims of Hurricane Dorian seeking solace and refuge with families in the United States of America were on a boat that was turned around and denied entrance to be with their families while the Taliban is getting VIP invitations to come and sit at Camp David. We have come to pray. We pray because the dignity and the value of all human life is being threatened daily by privilege, gun violence, police brutality, and yea, may I even say political apathy. And yet in the face of all that we deal with daily, we don't give up, we don't capitulate, and we don't throw in the towel. Because somewhere in the DNA of our spirituality, Bill Lamar, we hear the voices of our ancestors reminding us that we have been here before. This is not the first time we face racism. This is not the first time evil has reigned on the throne. This is not the first time the odds have been stacked against us. And we have the audacity to believe that the same God who carried us through separate but equal will carry us through stand your ground. The same God who held us during the lynchings of the red summer of 1919 will carry us through Charlottesville and Charleston. 
the God that led us through Emmett and Carol and Denise and Cynthia and Addie Mae is the God that will guide us through Trayvon and Tamir and Sandra and Mike and countless others. We believe there is a God somewhere. And we've come to pray because we believe that that God hears and answers prayer. We've come to pray because we believe that the prayer of the righteous is still powerful. We come to pray because my dad was right when he said it grammatically incorrect that what prayer can't do can't be did. We gather to pray because we believe the words of the prophet who said that if God's people called by God's name would humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways that our nation could be healed. We come to pray because that old school hymnal taught us to sing, if you have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about your troubles, he'll hear your faintest cry and answer by and by. We pray because we believe that if two or three touching together can change something, Imagine what happens when 3,200 gathered in one space touch and agree and ask God to heal our land. We pray because somebody at your table has found out that when you put something in the hands of God, that when you've got enough good sense to kneel down by your bedside and bow your head and close your eyes and lift up your voice to a God who you put your faith in, that that God is well able to go exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We've come to pray. But before you shout too prematurely, before you think that's all it takes, before you believe that all we have to do is bow our head and close our eyes, let me remind you of the words of the mystic theologian and philosopher Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman, that Morehouse valedictorian, mentor to Martin Luther King, first dean of the chapel at Rankin at Howard University. Howard Thurman suggested that the power of prayer is directly correlated to your willingness to be part of God's answer. Let me say that again. The power of prayer is not found in the eloquence of your speech. The power of prayer is not rooted in your ability to lift up every religious cliche that church taught you. The power of prayer is not found in how many tongues you can talk in. But the power of prayer is directly rooted in your willingness to be part of God's answer. What Howard Thurman realized is what I shared with you early this morning, that whatever you pray for, God calls you to. Whatever's on your prayer list will be part of God's assignment on your life. Whatever you give to God in prayer, God ultimately gives back to you in assignment. That it's not just that you give it to God, but that God empowers you to now go do something about it. I mean, if, if you're a little slow and you don't agree with me, let me make my argument out of scripture. That's the lesson, Brother Martin, we learn when we get to the seventh chapter of Joshua. If you've been to Sunday school, you'll remember that by the time we get to Joshua chapter 7, some things have happened that we need to be mindful of. By Joshua chapter 7, the Israelites, the people of God, have been delivered from bondage in Egypt. Shake your head like you know that one. For 400 years, they had been enslaved in Egypt. God hears their cry. And under the hand of Moses, God delivers Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea and handles Pharaoh and his armies and blesses the Israelites with a benediction saying, you ain't ever got to worry about them jokers no more. I've taken care of that. 
by the seventh chapter of Joshua, we've not only come out of Egypt, but now they've made it through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, moving from bondage to promise. By Joshua 7, not only have they come out of wilderness, not only have they been delivered from bondage, but they have survived the death of Moses. Moses is dead. Joshua assumes leadership. And by the grace of God, the Israelites can endure what most organizations cannot, the transition of leadership. By Joshua 7, after coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, making it through the wilderness, surviving the death of Moses, with Joshua at the helm of leadership, the Israelites have done the unthinkable. They have conquered Jericho. Jericho, that impenetrable city that sat atop a mountain with walls so high they could not be climbed and an army so great it had never been defeated. Jericho had never been defeated by a conquering army in its history. And here come the Israelites, these fledgling ex-slaves who made it through wilderness, who've crossed Red Sea, who've survived the transition of leadership. Here they come with little to no military training, with no armament and weaponry, and they take down the mighty city of Jericho. They do what no one else has ever done. Not because they're so smart. Not because they've got degrees. Not because they woke up in hotels so nice you can't even steal the towels no more. Not because of that. But because they found out that their God was always with them. They, they did not have systematic theology or orthodox doctrine, but they knew Emmanuel. They knew what someone today has found out, that if God be for you, <laughs> wish I was at my own church, if God is on your side, that nothing can stand against you. They have found out that God is with them. Because of the Lord on their side, they have done what no one else has ever done. That's when we get to Joshua 7. And in Joshua 7, these people who have known victory and have experienced the power of God on their side, they now get ready for another battle with a city called Ai. Come here, let me teach you a little Bible. Um, Ai is not Jericho. Ai has no walls. Ai has no military might. Dr. Dyson, according to biblical scholars, Ai was a Canaanite farming community that only had about 1,500 residents. AI is nothing like Jericho. And these people who have defeated Jericho, delivered from Egypt, made it through the wandering wilderness, now go up and attack AI. And the Bible says, that these 1,500 farmers in AI swiftly, soundly, and sorely defeat the Israelites. You go home and read Joshua 7, they sent them running with their tails tucked, tears running down their eyes. And the Bible says that the heart of Israel melted in fear as they realized we have not conquered Ai. Here's where the story gets good. After losing to Ai, Bishop McKenzie, the Bible says that Joshua and the elders of Israel gathered together for a prayer breakfast. 
their defeat. The Bible says in Joshua 7, they gathered together. Carson Butterfield, they tore off their clothes. They laid prostrate on their face before the Ark of the Covenant. They sprinkled dust on their foreheads and they prayed and prayed and prayed and they prayed because they could not understand how this happened. How can a people who have been delivered from Egypt, who have a testimony of crossing Red Seas, who have survived wilderness wandering, who have conquered the unconquerable, how could they have lost to AI? How can a people who have been delivered from slavery, who made it through the journey of wandering from bondage to promise, who just achieved what no one else had ever done, who was sure that God was on their side, how could they wind up right here? How could a people who were once slaves and the Lord brought us out, how can a people who wandered from inequality to civil rights, how can a people who did what nobody thought could ever be done in 2008 and then did it again in 2012, how in the hell could they lose in 2016? That they woke up with the same thing we did on November 9th, 2016, wondering how did this happen? And for the last 967 days, there has not been a morning I've awakened and turned on the television and wanted to ask God, how in the world did we get to this place? How did we land in a place where HBCUs are shutting down for lack of funding, but the prison system is making millions of dollars off of the unjust incarceration of black and brown bodies. How did we land in a place where Felicity Hoffman could spend $15,000 to jack up the low test scores of her daughter, but Tanya McDowell, a homeless black woman trying to do right by her child, gets five years in jail. How do we wind up in a place where the death of seven folk from e-cigarettes causes the swift banning of electronic cigarettes, but 323 mass shootings leaving more than 3,000 dead has not led to the change of gun reform and gun access in America. Do me a favor, go Baptist on your neighbor and ask him, how did we get here? They don't know how they got to AI. Now, now right here, I'm about to find my clothes, but I can tell you there are two directions this sermon could go in. But Dr. Dyson, I could spend the next seven and a half minutes telling you how the Israelites lost to AI. I can tell you how they allowed the arrogance of their past to cause them to change the success battle and strategy of the future. 
I can tell you how they underestimated AI and did not take enough people to the pole, I mean battlefield, <laughs> like they should have. I could argue that they had leaders whose desire for personal gain outweighed their commitment to personal good. I could tell you that they ostracized members of their own community because of sexual identity, which ain't got nothing to do with the landscape that we're battling in right now. I could tell you how they allowed men to write legislation that controlled the reproductive organs of a woman, and that is not in the will of God. I could tell you. How they allowed an evangelical white right to hijack the term evangelical and distort Christianity as if it has no social justice and demand for equality that's in the heart of Jesus Christ. I could go down that road. But let me tell you the juicier road. Joshua and the elders of Israel trying to figure out how they got here called a prayer meeting. They gathered together and they called on the name of the Lord. I bet they used every religious cliche we know how to use. God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Thou who was before there was a was and shall be when ain't ain't no more. God, we thank you that last night was not our last night. Thank you that you've allowed our golden moments to roll on just a little bit longer. Thank you that the four corners of our bed were not the four corners of our cooling board. And God, we come before you head bowed and body bent beseeching your mercy, oh God, as we've lost to AI. They are having a prayer meeting. <laughs> and here's where it gets good. You ready? While they are praying in Joshua chapter 7, Jamal in verse number 10, God shows up. God showed up to the prayer meeting. And listen to what God says. God sees everybody in prayer about the loss at AI, and God shows up, and this is what he says, don't miss this. God says, what are y'all doing? Stop praying. Get on your feet. Get yourself together and go back and fight again. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure you don't miss that. They, 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 they are praying. Bishop Proctor, they are sure enough praying. And the Lord shows up. And the Lord says, prayer time is over. I have heard your prayer. Stop whining. Stop complaining. Stop moaning. Stop bickering. Get on your feet. Prayer time is over. Let the battle begin. God shows up and tells Israel, the power of your prayer is directly correlated to your willingness to be part of God's answer. Lord says, I'm going to answer your prayer, but the answer begins to you. Um, that, that this is an instance where the Lord doesn't show up and say, I'll fight for you. The Lord shows up and says, I'll fight with you. We like getting holy and putting it in God's hands, but every now and then, the Lord comes back and says, listen, we going to win, but you got to fight. You got to do what I've called you to do. 
You've got to gear yourself up, stand strong, get back in that battle, and know that if God is with you, Um, I got to go. The Lord shows up and says it's time to end the prayer. I know we don't preach this a lot because everybody tells you you ought to just keep on praying, but there is a moment when the prayer has to come to an end. There's a moment when worship must have a benediction. We can't sit in the sanctuary all day long. There's a moment when you got to come out of your prayer closet. You got to get up off your knees and hear the Lord say, it's time to end the prayer. Now, 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 don't, 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 don't do it, Marcus. Don't, don't, don't push me. Um, I don't know what tradition you were raised in, but every good prayer ends the same way that when it's time to end the prayer if you got any good religious training you know that there's one word that you use to end a prayer there's one word that says prayer time is over and that is the word amen and I came by to tell you in the gospel of Kevin Hart that God told me to tell you let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Now, now, now I know, I know, I know, I'm good Baptist. So I need you to know that I am well versed in all the rhetorical linguistic devices that are meant to make a congregation back up the preacher. I know how to say, can I get an amen? know that if the sermon ain't going well I, I can look at Alpha Street and say can I push it? I know I can ask is there anybody here who loves the Lord? If it's not going well I can holler out if it had not been for the Lord on our side. I know how to look at my musician and say A flat. I know he's alright. it's going really bad. Bill, I know how to get up and go old school Baptist and holler early. One Sunday morning, he got up from the dead. I know how to do all of that. But when I say let the church say amen, I'm not trying to manipulate a praise. I'm not trying to get you to shout. I'm trying to get you to recognize that the prayer is over and the battle must begin. Goodbye, CBC. But let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Amen. Now go register. Amen. Now go vote. Join me in welcoming back to the stage, Congresswoman Frederica S. Wilson. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. I can't remember.
Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Howard Gunn Wesley. Thank you for so powerfully uplifting our spirits at a crucial time in our nation and fortifying us for the many challenges ahead. Before the benediction, we ask kindly that everyone remain seated until the dais participants exist, exit. We ask that you greet in the lobby area where we will wait for you so that the ballroom can quickly and com be completely turned over for tonight's Phoenix Awards dinner. Once again, please do not approach the stage after the benediction. We will all meet you in the lobby. Finally, let me remind you to pick up your complimentary gift for attending the prayer breakfast in Exhibit Hall E, Booth 251. The gift is a beautiful and timely Pan American devotional guide entitled Lament and Hope. Lament and Hope that commemorates the 400th anniversary of the arrival of our African ancestors on America's shores and fits perfectly with the theme of our conference, 400 years, our legacies, our possibilities. We thank the bread of the world and Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith for this amazing gift. And I want to say to our pastor that we believe that with God we can win. The CBC believes that we can beat the White House, beat Mr. Trump, and beat all of the white supremacists who dare to stand in our way. We will win because we have 400 years of practice. And now I am pleased to introduce to you from Miami, Florida, for our benediction Pastor Rochelle Williams. She is the executive pastor and chief of staff for Jesus People Ministries Church International, South Florida, that works with organizations throughout the city, state, and nation to better the lives of people in greatest need. A dynamic young leader who is a mover and shaker in the faith community following in the footsteps of her mother, the dynamic pastor Gloria Williams. She is a woman for all seasons. Pastor Rochelle Williams will bring us the benediction. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I don't know how you close after a close like that already, but I, we're gonna do what God says. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that word. And to all of the wonderful, uh, distinguished people that are here this morning, uh, thank you to the CBC chairs. Everyone, let's give God a praise and a round of applause that we've been able to share in such a great and honorable time. They told me I had 10 more minutes. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to close this out. But if you will, let us pray right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. And Lord, we bless you today that you have now equipped us as the people of color with everything that we need to execute our assignment of building and bridging. Oh, the words that we've heard today will bring us enlightenment but because we know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And Father, this morning we, we come against the spirit of fear, confusion, 
heartbreak, victimization, disparity, disappointment, lack, and pain. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. And as we leave this place, thank you that our future generations will stand strong and come together. Our voice, our moral values, our insights, our intellect, our abilities, God, our education and resources that you've provided us with will continue to help us build and bridge our ancestry like never before. We thank you for this Congression of Black Caucus, the powerful organization that chairs the leadership that will continue to stand and bring awareness in our community. And as we know, Lord, may your blessings keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us. And your gracious love towards us, God, bring us through each and every storm. May your salvation of everlasting life be proclaimed to us over and over. And may we walk in your love both now and forever. It's in your son's precious name that we say, amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you.